I just want to give you a quick understanding of the Marshall umbrella. This is a model that we use to define where combatives belongs within the spectrum of self-protection, if you like. So imagine an umbrella and underneath it is every type of martial endeavor. So starting first of all with traditional martial arts. Many of us, including me, started with traditional martial arts. So I started with Japanese karate, Wororu. Then I went to Shotokan and to Kyokushinkai. At that time I also practiced uh, Japanese um, judo and uh, also looked at Aikido and various sort of things from a very young age, but traditional martial arts. Next would be no particular order. So there's no particular order of importance. I'm just listing them. Would be the more uh, modern in compared to those times because there was no mixed martial arts around then. You know, combat sport, mixed martial arts. Um, so before that, you've got boxing, you've got you know, Thai boxing, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, mixed martial arts in the main, which are an eclectic method of practicing all of those, as well as um, my favorite, which is Lethway, Burmese boxing, all combat sport. So, going by rules, weight class, etc. But nonetheless, a martial endeavor. Now, where this is going is geared towards self-protection from a self-defense, self-preservation point of view. Now, of course, any of the physical methods employed within traditional martial arts could be employed for that. And most certainly, any, any method employed within combat sport could be implemented for the purpose of the physical element of self-protection, for sure. But generally, self-defense or self-protection or methods of self-protection or reality-based self-defense, whatever you want to call it, are geared specifically for that. So traditional martial arts, although they could have a self-defense element to them, are geared mainly for what they are, for the art, practice of the art, for art's sake. Uh, there's some sporting elements to that, um, the etiquette, the discipline, physical conditioning, as well as the physical ability that it gives you. So it's a more encompassing overall thing which you're going to get from traditional martial arts. Combat sport, of course, governed by rules, is a sport. But again, you, know, you look at martial athletes that compete in these kind of endeavors, super fit people, super fit athletes, super strong mindset, and absolutely capable in all elements of martial prowess in a physical sense. So of course, it could be translated in a gem to protecting themselves, as I'm sure many have. But self-defense or self-protection in particular has no sporting element and has no artistic element attached to it. It's primarily for the purpose of personal security. And that could be everything from what you might term as self-defense, which would be just improved methods of um, personal security, heightened awareness and understanding of pre-threat recognition, knowing your environment, where to go, where not to go, becoming much more situationally aware, uh, learning to be a good communicator so you could plausibly de-escalate a situation that you might find yourself in, uh, learning methods to use a, um, a, a physical and a verbal boundary so in case you're encroached upon and then of course in a physical sense learning physical skills don't like to use the word but techniques in order to potentially counter um, you know, an, an aggressive threat now self-defense is what it says it is so if you are defending you are already being you have already been assaulted you are already under attack. So really, if you are defending, you're already fucking losing. So if a guy grabs you and you do this, this and this, if somebody grabs your wrist and you do this, this and this, if somebody holds you up with a knife and now you do A, B and C, you are now reacting to what the person's doing to you. Which of course, 
is never the ideal of the actual self-defense part of any self-defense curriculum is the physical part where in the main there is no proactive uh, engagement or use of force on your part um, there is no although there may be uh, elements that are geared towards you know seeing a potential problem and avoiding it uh, de-escalating it in the main self-defense does not teach preemption so you've got self-defense that could be anything from an old retired army captain teaching a bunch of people men and women in a local leisure center how to break away from somebody grabbing your wrist this would be self-defense then that may elaborate to what's called uh, rbsd or reality-based self-defense personally i prefer reality-based self-protection as a term but reality-based self-defense so the krav maga um, market you know, pretty much caters for the reality based type of self defense and there's many others fast defense and many many other good people out there that teach uh, reality based self defense some use the term reality based self protection mainly for the reason that I just said because if what you're implementing is defense in the physical sense then you're already under attack whereas self protection indicates that um, before you could be physically assaulted, there are certain elements in place, such as awareness, which is your radar, allows you to spot a situation before it becomes a situation and therefore avoid um, using uh, contact management and a physical verbal boundary, such as a fence, contact management, etc., will again allow you to negotiate a potential problem before it comes in physical contact with you. So self-protection as opposed to self-defense indicates that there are certain hurdles for the uh, perpetrator to negotiate before it gets to the physical part. Many methods that teach self-protection or self-defense or reality-based self-defense in this way um, focus on a pretty low level use of force not all but some so some just focus on you know stun and run type of tactics breakaway type of tactics or uh, some even control and restraint type tactics as opposed to uh, you know using um, impactive force although that may be part of the picture too but generally self-defense reality-based self-defense use a, a, a kind of level of force continuum of course but designed more towards the lower end so in my experience the way that i would define practitioners of self-defense that teach their students they're basically teaching their students how not to be victims how to potentially be a harder target and how not to be perceived as a victim and in a physical sense how to deal with the problem that's already upon them potentially which, you know, are all, are all good things. There's, there's nothing negative about that. Some do teach preemption and still coin the term self-defense or reality-based self-defense, and that's good. But generally, on the whole, reality-based self-defense is a kind of mediocre point within the scale of self-protection. Whereas, combatives is considered more at the extreme end the self-protection scale so first of all combatives is not a style it's not a system yeah, as soon as you stylize or systemize something you put it in a box and close the lid and nail it shut and give it no room for growth rather combatives as I've said before is basically giving yourself permission to be fucking combative and use tried and tested concepts principles and methods that have proved to work under non-compliant fight duress, where there's the presence of adrenaline, fear, confusion, pain, disorientation, fatigue, etc. Now, if the what you do works, it's considered combatives. And usually that is born out of some kind of testing environment. So a lot of people say that the combatives comes primarily from you know the world war ii elements but if you look back in history as literally as far back as you can go from whenever men have had conflict with each other then if somebody has armed or unarmed you know successfully dealt with their adversary then what they implemented 
was successful and any implemented use of a tactic, be it uh, principle, concept or a physical skill set that proved itself to work is now generally considered combative. So we all know that the word combative means argumentative, willing to fight. Well, this place can get combative at times. It could you know, be pointing to the environment as being dangerous. Whereas the word combatives, plural, you won't find in a dictionary. It's a modern word coined by the self-protection fraternity that has come to mean the use of any uh, principle, concept, skill, tactic, whatever you want to call it, that has proved itself reliably to work under fight stress condition. This is considered combatives. Now, why I say that's at the extreme end of the self-protection scale is, is because combatives are designed among a myriad of rules of engagement. So it could be civilian self-protection for the average man and woman. It could be um, specifically de designed as defensive tactics for law enforcement. It could be specifically geared towards close protection or bodyguard work or specifically geared towards the rules of engagement within security. Uh, and also, of course, the specifically geared towards the rules of engagement within a military concept, within a military environment. So that could be anything from you know, crowd control to um, century removal, you know, and, and anything in between. So the rules of engagement dictate, you know, <coughs> what use of force implementation you're going to apply but combatives historically has been applied to civilian self-protection law enforcement security and military right up to and including dealing with a level 10 threat or deadly force and that's where the separation is between self-defense reality-based self-defense and combatives combatives are designed primarily for dealing with a real threat to life where there's a high probability that there is a threat disparity that could create deadly force. Definition of deadly force, any force offered to you that um, could create grievous bodily harm and or your death. Well, I'm sure, unless you live in a fucking ivory tower with rose tinted blinkers, that you can see the, the societal environment is changing. Things are becoming you know, unstable, and along with that, society is becoming more dangerous. People say, oh, it's much easier today than it was in our yesteryears of our ancestors. Of course, our ancestors grew up with war and had to fight for the definitive right to live, eat and be, for sure. So they were much more known to our ancestors than now. And social conditioning has deliberately made people you know, reliant on the government and soft. So if they were to in come across the kind of environments of our ancestors now in a warring faction sense, then of course they would, um, in the majority, not be prepared on a physical or emotional level or a psychological level. But if you look at the way things are today, I personally believe society is becoming a lot more dangerous than it ever has. So the average threat that you would face let's go back as far as 10 to 15 years, would be either some sort of intimidation or verbal threatening, which is a psychological assault, some sort of physical assault where you've been struck or grabbed, the two usually integrate themselves. If the person has a weapon, they will hit you, or hold you and hit you, or hit you and hold you, or hold you while someone else hits you. Or there's gonna be the application of a weapon, or weapon's gonna be involved, or there's gonna be multiple assailants. So obviously weapon and multiple assailants are an obvious threat disparity, as is anyone bigger, stronger, larger, more aggressive than you threat disparity. If you came across somebody who was trained in some way, that would be a threat disparity. But what you are seeing now, quite commonly, is situations where there are multiple armed assailants. Well, I don't know of any unarmed skill set that I could show you or give you that will give you a high probability of success under such conditions. 
So in a combative sense, as a trainee, um, it would be my advice to you that you would uh, better serve yourself to, to develop good personal security skills so you can avoid an escape, uh, possibly spot a situation before it becomes one. It's the best self protection always don't be there. And then, of course, learn a physical unarmed skill set that you need to take to a high level. By a high level, I would suggest that combative training unarmed skills would take it up to potentially what you might refer to as a military grade, and that is learning how, in the worst case scenario, how to implement the tools that God give you, unarmed skills, right up to the point of dealing with a level 10 threat. So if you are faced with deadly force, know how to deliver potentially up to and including deadly force unarmed. And also learn as many weapon systems as you can. Learn how to use a point and edge weapon. Learn how to use a blunt force trauma impact weapon. Learn how to use an improvised weapon of opportunity. And uh, if where you live allows, learn how to shoot. Learn as many weapon systems as possible. I'm not telling anyone to break any laws here, but I am saying that you should be familiar with how weapons work, how they can be used against you, and how you could potentially use them in order to stop the same. Now we're moving into the realms of you are facing a deadly threat, in which case that's where combatives belongs at the extreme end of the self-protection scale designed for real threat to life. So if you're facing a potentially real threat to life situation, you're facing a level 10 threat. And if you want to be able to deal with a level 10 threat, you need to cultivate a level 10 response. That doesn't mean you will need to implement a level 10 response. But it means any situation that you find yourself in, you should be prepared to. In which case, now you have the ability. Another model that we will look at is the violence volume dial. And the violence volume dial set to 10 would be your maximum use of force. Necessary because you are facing a maximum threat to life, deadly force threat. So like I said, if you want to be able to deal with a deadly force threat or a level 10 threat, you've got to have cultivate a level 10 response. So think about it in simple numbers. If the training that you implement in terms of a violence volume dial is only willing to go to the point where you subdue or control somebody, then you're looking at training around a level six or a seven. If you only train to a level 6 or a 7 and you face a 10, you're fucked. You can't turn up what you ain't got. Whereas if you have an understanding of what you could possibly face out there, and you cultivate the ability to, without hesitation, uh, implement a level 10 use of force, well, now you've got a chance. You could cultivate that ability and you can still lose. There's no guarantees here. But one thing is for sure, you can't turn up when you ain't got. And conversely, if you have the ability to implement up to and including a level 10 use of force, then you can always turn it down should the, you know, the split second that you realise what you're facing isn't what they thought they were. So if the threat I deem, I'm going to deem in my head as a 10, but if I recognise immediately, you know, as soon as I make physical contact, if I grab and manhandle the person and they don't really feel like what I thought they were, well now I can turn my response down. Or if I hit with one good solid shot and it's finished, well now I turn my response down to a point where I will control their descent to the ground and cease further action. So it's not a case of everything needs a level 10, just it is, it is a case of that you should be prepared to go to level 10 in your mind you should have the ability to do that. Now, if you find yourself in a situation that doesn't warrant that, you can immediately turn it down. With that kind of cultivation of that kind of skill comes huge responsibility. So you must cultivate a level of force continuum, whereby you will only use a level of force that will be deemed reasonable and necessary under the circumstances, but that can be up to and including deadly force if the person was going to kill you. But great responsibility comes with that. So you have to cultivate the emotional conditioning and psychological conditioning so that you can state manage 
in that moment so that when you recognize inside of a fight dynamic if you need to um, cease further action you can hit that big red stop button in your brain and be able to do that and of course that part of that kind of psychological conditioning is a big part of UC but my point is in terms of the martial umbrella understand where combatives stands it is at the extreme end of the self-protection scale so again to recap no particular order of importance but you've got traditional martial arts combat sport self-defense moving into the realms of reality-based self-defense reality-based self-protection and then you've got combatives so combatives are designed for the worst case scenario and that's why we train the way we train them.